Okay. Um, yeah, again, so a very warm welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining today on your Saturday afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Um, my name is Raimar, and I'm the facilitator for the course, also the kind of founder of the Vipassana at Home page. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll just get right started. So if you want to, you can find your position and close down the eyes and really just resting, just arriving in your senses. Almost like we're just letting our system know that we are here, we are safe. Scanning the sounds, feeling the room that you're in, feeling the feeling of sitting. Just kind of letting our whole mind body system know that we are safe. And we can relax. You can feel the feeling of sitting a little bit more. How does the position of the body feel? The posture of the body sitting. Where does the body contact other objects like the ground or the seat or the cushion or chair? Where does the body contact itself? So maybe the hands on each other or on your knees or lap. And we can really relax and soften. No need to get anywhere do anything special or create or maintain anything at all. Just arriving and you are not here alone. So we've got about 10 people on the call live. Many more will be watching this offline. People from all over the world I've saw, seen India, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, South America, North America. I think there was even one from Africa. So there's a lot of people out there and you've all signed up for this course. Each of you is interested in what this technique of Vipassana meditation can do for you, what, what it can bring to your life. So for the next 10 days, feel that you are together in this journey. the Sangha, the spiritual community. And staying with your body here.
relaxing any areas. especially the jaw, the hands, the shoulders, the legs. So usually when we start more intensive meditation periods, we take the five precepts, which are kind of guidelines for um, ethical conduct, sort of things that help us during our day, pay more attention to what we're doing, pay attention to the way we speak, the way we relate, we relate to other beings. And I'm just going to read these precepts or principles out loud to you. Whether you follow them or not is completely up to you. You are a free, free person, but they definitely aid the meditation practice by helping us um, start with more peace of mind. If there's a lot of guilt or shame or anger in the mind, it's much more difficult to meditate. So continuing to have the eyes closed here and you can just reflect on these as I read them one by one. The first precept is abstaining from killing any living beings. not taking life. The second one is abstaining from taking what is not given. So abstaining from stealing. The third one being abstaining from wrong speech, harmful speech or lying. So not harming anything, anyone with our speech. The fourth one is abstaining from sexual misconduct. So any sexual acts of violence, um, sexual acts that harm ourselves or others. And the last one being abstaining from any intoxicating substances. So each of these precepts, you might already have some interpretations of those. And um, these precepts are a kind of spectrum. You can take them super seriously. For example, with intoxicating substances, you can really try not to have any coffee or anything like this at all. And, but you also don't have to be too strict with them. So you just try to avoid things like alcohol and uh, marijuana, other intense drugs, psychedelics. Um, but if you're used to having a daily coffee, you don't have to quit cold turkey. Um, but at least try to try to kind of cut back on these things which cloud our perception slightly. Okay. So you can open up the eyes again. Um, yeah, so these five precepts, you're, you're free, to, free to follow them. I also send out a link which explains them a little bit more. Um, and yeah, as I said, they can be, they kind of form the foundation of our practice. Um, we start with these precepts and it's also really what we keep coming back to even as we practice for many, many years, the, the ultimate uh, thing is really how to live a wise, how to live a wise and kind life, how to uh, master the art of living. So it's something, how to live properly, is something we always keep coming back to. Meditation isn't just about sitting on the cushion and experiencing some crazy states or something like this, but we always want to keep coming back to how we live life and how we are in our relationships, how we relate to ourselves, um, etc. But that's something that I'll keep touching on. So just, just maybe starting to say a few words um, about myself, who is, who is this person who's, uh, who thinks that he can uh, maybe say, share his experience about meditation. So I grew up in Germany. 
until I was about 18 and then moved to Australia where I studied in economics and finance and worked in finance as well. So I was working for a company called Vanguard, um, working in investment management. And it was first in university that I kind of discovered meditation about um, seven years ago and where it helped me a little bit, but it wasn't until I really started getting more stressed out from trying to get all the best internships and kind of hustling and, and doing that when I got really stressed and then I kind of went more deeper into mindfulness and um, that really, yeah, helped to balance that. Um, I worked in, when I was working in finance, I was also kind of using all my annual leave to go on meditation retreats, meditating two hours a day um, and, and always had the plan to kind of leave that after some time and explore it deeper. And then so um, during COVID, so since about two years, I've been living in Thailand um, where I've just been, yeah, visiting different temples, but also um, exploring mindfulness in other, in other realms, for example, um, sports, free diving, in improvised dancing, um, exploring mindfulness in my relationships. So I really tried to, um, as well as going deep, I uh, really also try to bring mindfulness into my whole life. And yeah, hopefully I can share some of what I've learned um, through that. Um, this is really a much more a container or holding the space for um, the practice to teach you. So all I'm, I don't want to think of myself as a teacher or telling you this is the way or th this, this is the way. This is not like a dogmatic or religious thing. Um, it's much more showing you a technique with which you can investigate your own experiences and investigate for yourself what is true for you. Um, so I'm much more a guide for that technique to, to teach you yourself. And that's really where the change will happen through something you see in your own experience, not just what you, what you hear from someone or, or what you can think about intellectually or rationalize. It's much more about experiencing. So, um, yeah, I will also ask you some questions throughout this, this lecture. So my first question to you, and you can just use the chat, chat function to answer that, which is somewhere down here. My first question to you is, what do you want from meditation? Or why are you here? What brings you here today? And maybe you can just write three keywords and that attract you to uh, joining this course. If you are watching re recorded, you can also write that in the YouTube comments if you want. Okay, the answer is coming in. Um, peace, discipline, and clarity. Wonderful. Connection, meaning in life. Peace of mind and expand consciousness. Interesting. Be more mindful. Stefano, why do you want to be more mindful? What do you think mindfulness will bring to your life? All right. Commitment, deepening, and connection. Know, th know thyself. <laughs> nice. That's what Goenka says also in this retreat. Great. So, yeah, everyone has different, uh, different answers a little bit. But, yeah, so we all come, come with different reasons, and all of those reasons are legitimate things. Um, I didn't see anything which I would say that mindfulness cannot uh, cannot bring, but maybe it doesn't bring it in the way that you expect it to. Um, peace, connection with source and clarity, focus, calm down the mind, connection with yourself. Yeah. Um, so 
the what I see in common is that each of you are really citing things which are to do with the mind and how the mind works. So all of you want certain things. There's certain themes like wanting to be more focused, discipline, more peaceful, more clarity, etc. So in order to do this, we, we need to find out how the mind actually works. Um, so at the moment, um, it's very, the mind can be very confusing. We are constantly changing our mind state. Sometimes we feel happy, sometimes sad. And oftentimes it seems like the things on the outside are causing this happiness or sadness. And this and this happened and I feel upset. This and this happened, I feel happy. Um, when I have this, I'm happy. When I don't have this, then I don't feel happy, etc. All these stories, all these conditions which we, which we create. Um, and what we're trying to do in meditation, or in this specifically in Vipassana meditation, is really to understand body and mind, to understand how this whole system of my thoughts, my experience, my feelings, my emotions, my sensations, my body, um, how they interact, um, how they cause each other, how they affect each other. Um, so we're really trying to find out how this whole thing works so that we can see, ah, this and this always tends to lead towards happiness. This and this always tends to lead towards my unhappiness or, or discomfort, etc. And so we can start to see and we can start to choose, not by suppressing things, not by distracting ourselves, but by being with um, exactly what is. So meditation is also called um, bhavana. Bhavana, I'll just post that in the chat. Bhavana means cultivation in Pali. So meditation is also a space where we um, are cultivating certain qualities within us. We, we want to cultivate more kindness. Ah, in, our, in our meditation, we can cultivate kindness towards our thoughts, towards our reactions, towards our emotions. And that will then in turn um, impact the way we relate to things on the outside in, in the real life. Um, so meditation is also really a cultivation. This course emphasizes the practice of meditation. So the practice is really the most important thing. The practice, so by practice, I mean when you are applying mindfulness, when you are applying the technique um, on the cushion or off the cushion, it is really where you train yourself, where you start to change the habit pattern of the mind experientially. And um, when we sit down to practice, we're kind of like simplifying our experience. Experience. We're simplifying the amount of inputs and stimuli that we're having. So it's basically like we're trying to learn how to drive a car. If we, tr if we try to lear learn to drive a car in a busy city with lots of traffic and things happening, we're going to be so overwhelmed and we're not going to be able to figure out how to put the thing in gear, how to brake, how to think, we are just going to keep crashing into things. So that's why in meditation, we're kind of simplifying all the stimuli. We're okay, we're doing something quite simple. We're sitting down and even then things can already be quite complex. And then we start to see how does, how do things work? What leads to what, um, what is my experience actually? Um, and these, so these lectures, are really there just to help you understand how to practice properly. And um, so the thinking mind can, can help us to, to kind of have more faith, more confidence in the technique, but the technique and doing it is really is what's going to make the change. Just like we can't, we can talk about how to drive a car for ages, but we actually need to sit in and, and try to drive the car to, to learn how to do that. I also have a few slides which I'll share from time to time. Some of the corporate world hasn't uh, hasn't left me. So this was a slide about body and mind. We already talked about that. Yeah. So there's basically three different things that we are learning throughout this course. In the first four days, we will talk about, and, and we will practice Anapanasati, which basically 
translates as mindfulness of breathing. Anapana means uh, respiration or breathing and sati means mindfulness. So in the first four days, and just like yesterday in the day zero evening meditation, you focused on the breath at the nose. And the point of um, concentration meditation or uh, indistractable, indistractability meditation is to be able to maintain a continuous awareness on something that you choose. So we are kind of simplifying it and calming experience down by just focusing on the breath at the nose so that later we can um, bring that awareness and that continu continuity of focus towards um, our whole body and, and investigate what's happening in the whole body. Um, so because when we start meditating, we are there's so much going on in our heads, so many thoughts, etc. So we just want to settle this a little bit before we can start to really see what's going on. That brings me to the second part, which is Vipassana. Vipassana, um, we'll talk more about that from, from in the day five lecture on Wednesday, what that exactly is. But essentially, it's also translated sometimes as mindfulness meditation. Um, and that's where really generating wisdom or insight, um, insight into how this whole mind-body system works, um, insight into impermanence the fact that things are always changing um, and this is really where the true magic starts to happen um, but we will we will get into that and then the last thing is of course the uh the right intention for practicing the the morality the pre the precepts and um, this is kind of always underpinning our whole practice and um, if we have an intention of practicing to try and become um to try and hurt others, to try and um, uh, develop more ego around around the practice and our skills, etc., and we won't really make much progress in the practice. So it's important to have that intention of doing no harm, doing good. Um, so meditating with the right motivation. Okay. So just a brief example to illustrate. Um this, so first we'll practice Anapanasati and then Vipassana. So it's a bit like in Anapanasati in, in the Samadhi or concentration meditation, we are right now our minds like super messy. There's lots of stuff and junk everywhere. And by focusing our mind a little bit, by bringing more calm into it and more ability to focus on one thing at a time, we are just kind of cleaning up a little bit we are tidying up a bit so that we can in vipassana actually start to see what is there what do we want to keep and um, what are the things i like don't like um, and start to see how that whole thing works okay so I have one more question here for you. How would you rate your ability to focus on what you choose? So whether that's in meditation or in your life, during your work, or even in conversations, or even during this lecture. How good is your ability to focus? And you can rate it just from one to five, five being super easy and one being um, very difficult. Three and one and three. Two, threes. Three on average, yeah, but you're noticing that you're better at focusing when you're interested or enjoying the activity for sure. Five, okay, effortless focus, great. Right. 
Okay. So we have a whole range of different things. And yeah, as Navda pointed out, when we uh, enjoy what we're doing, it's usually a little bit easier to do it. Um, that's a nice, nice thing for a nice tip for meditation to in the beginning of the meditation and also throughout, just remind yourself a little bit that we're not trying to force or beat up the mind or fight the mind, struggling against it because that will make it very difficult. Um, we are, if you can come back to relaxing and paying attention in a nice, effortless, relaxed way, um, this will be closer to um, how, how we will um, make more progress. So kind of having a little bit more of a positive, positive reinforcement. But I'll, yeah, I'll also guide that in the, in the, in the meditations. That's why I always also remind you that um, to be kind to yourself, to kind of come back to a sense of forgiving yourself, because these things help bolster our practice along much better than if we force ourselves the whole time. And we can move in the opposite direction of that. So, yeah. The ability to focus on what you choose consistently and clearly, anapanasati. Um, in meditation, we are training the skill. It's, it's like we're going to the gym, we're lifting weights, and we're lifting our weights of, of focus, our, our ability to consistently and clearly come back to our meditation object, which in this case is the breath of the nose. Um, distractedness during meditation also translates quite directly to our distractedness in everyday life. And if you think about it, there's not really any anything that we do in our life which isn't affected by our baseline level of focus or our ability to be present or be with what is. Um, so even when you're working, of course, it's quite obvious that if you're more focused, you'll be more productive. But even with things which are not as obvious, for example, when you're in a conversation with someone, if you're more distracted, more in your mind, more thinking about your own stuff, you won't be as present with that person and you might miss something, you might be able to not uh, support them as much as you want to or uh, really learn as much as you can. Even when you're doing something like exercise, um, I found that my the way I relate to my body is completely different now because previously I just thought about physical exercise, for example, yoga, okay, it's just a physical thing. I can just think about whatever I want and I, all I have to do is the movement or the stretch um, and that, that will make my body good. Um, but now I found if I actually bring my attention into the body, I can feel much more detail and I can have much more awareness of how my hips, my joints, my ligaments all working together, which helps me go much deeper into um, having a healthy body. So really, yeah, no aspect of our human experience is not influenced by this baseline level of focus or presence. Um, yeah, so it's a very, very good thing to, to practice. One more question. Um, so you already had the, the meditation that you probably already did yesterday um, and maybe this morning even. How easy was it for you to sit for that one hour um, and how easy do you think it will be for the 10 days to sit for the hour in the morning, hour in the evening? And the whole range, Hema is a five again, <laughs> great. A three, a four, two, three. Um, so I, probably what you will find is that your answer to the last question is very directly correlated with your answer to this question. For example, Hema, who was a five before, is also answering a five now. And does focus. 
And yeah, Elian is saying that other commitments will sometimes make it challenging. Yeah, if there's conflicting intentions in the mind, part of your mind wants to meditate and part of your mind wants to think about uh, the plan or the commitments or um, things, then it will, will feel like there's kind of two parts of you which are going in opposite directions. And um, so we have a little bit of a, uh, actually maybe one thing that I want to say there is we are not, meditation isn't about sitting super long and sitting super still and uh, becoming really good at that. That's only a step to um, being able to pay more attention to our experience and how our experience works. So we kind of have two types of meditation. One is more concentration meditation where we become really good at focusing on something and one is more wisdom or insight or mindfulness meditation, vipassana meditation where rather than just focusing on one thing, we are much more aware of how our system interacts and how things work. So the, the, the point of concentration meditation is indistractability and focus and concentration. The point of Vipassana meditation is wisdom or insight. So understanding the nature of, of the way things work. And just because someone's really good at concentrating does not make them a very wise person because and they might be able to concentrate very deep, but they have no idea what else is going on. So actually it can become a hindrance if we become too good, too good at this. But we'll talk more about that on day five. So there's a little bit of a framework for, um, for what, what is called the five hindrances um, in which can come up in our meditation. And I just want to point these out to you because they are um, common across people. So these things can keep popping up. It, it always depends on our personality, on how we usually relate to things in life that determines also our state of mind, our mood can change from day to day that, that determines which one of these will kind of be hindrances to your meditation that they're also called the five hindrances. So the first one is liking or craving or greed. So when this is appearing, usually you start thinking about what you would like to do instead, or maybe you're starting to crave certain meditative experiences. Oh, I want more peacefulness. Why don't I feel peaceful? I want more peacefulness. So it can be something like this. And disliking is the opposite. So maybe you can either be thinking about stuff you don't like. Oh, yesterday this happened, or I should have said this to this person. Oh, I'm so stupid because I didn't say this. And there's kind of a sense of disliking. Um, also, it can be disliking something that's happening right now in your meditation. Like, oh, I feel so restless or I feel pain. I don't like it. I don't want it. Um, and in more intense form of that would be like straight out hatred or anger towards towards those things so there's always a bit of a spectrum in each the third one is worry or restlessness or anxiety you sit down on the cushion and you can't stop worrying thinking about um xyz that happened at work or in relationship or with your friends or maybe you're worrying about your meditation and worrying that it's not going good enough etc the fourth one is this kind of feeling of drowsiness, laziness. Um, so you just feel, man, I, just, I don't want to do this anymore. I just, it'd be so nice just to lie down now. And uh, I can just imagine how good it would be to lie down and chill. And maybe I can just lie down for 10 minutes and it'll be okay. And then you lie down and start dreaming and fall asleep. <laughs> so it can also be a dangerous one to, uh, to go into. Um, the last one is doubt. So doubt, expectations, this is very tricky because it really directly impacts the way you, you, you meditate because so doubt can happen. You can have doubt about the meditation technique. How does this work? I don't think this actually works. It can be doubt about um, yourself. Oh, I think the technique is good. Many people seem to be benefiting from it, but maybe it's not, just, not for me. I'm not really good enough. It's because of this and this. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not good at it. So usually also that's related to expectation. So what, what to do with this? Um, 
Um, the, the way to pass these is to keep noticing them as they arise and just to keep coming back to the meditation object. And the more you, you become indistractable, the more deeper your concentration, your level of calm becomes, the less these things um, start appearing. And so concentration meditation is really to overcome these hindrances. It's very likely that during this 10 days, you won't, you won't ever overcome them. I also find in my daily life, I don't, I don't tend not to move past them, but they definitely can decrease a lot in the strength. So maybe in the beginning, they really are super strong and you really believe them. But then after a few days, they'll be kind of there, but they'll be more in the background. So just let them kind of play around there in the background um, and notice when oh, it seems like all I'm doing is just worrying or disliking and just kind of gently let them move more towards the background and let your um, breath of the nose become your primary, primary thing that you're attending towards. Um, Navda is asking, we'll, we'll, we'll get to questions in the end maybe, so I'll just I'll keep that for later. But um, it's not it's not a bad thing as long as you notice that they're that it's not a bad thing they're happening, but the only thing you want to do is notice that they're happening and try not to believe them too much. Try to just stay with stay with your meditation object and then um, when the hour is over you can you can again think and like and dislike and doubt if you want to. Yeah, and these these it's interesting also because it directly con connects to to our life. Um, these hindrances are also really the things that make us happy, unhappy in life. And when we're in a relationship, we can have a lot of doubt about the relationship, doubt about our work. And so these the in meditation, we're always just seeing what is already happening in our life. Um, it's not that meditation is somehow special, different, and, and we're seeing something completely different. No, we're really just seeing ourselves as we are usually in life. But in life, we are typically not paying so much attention to our inner world. We just pay attention to the things on the outside. So in meditation, we're turning a bit more inwards and seeing rather than seeing the things that usually that, that feel like... Um, are uh, triggering those things. We are just observing these phenomena directly. Um, we have to accept everything, accepting the good, the bad, and, and the neutral. And over time, it, it gets better. Okay. So the last question for you. is do you tend, so this is related to how you usually approach your tasks. Do you tend more towards using a lot of effort and kind of trying or doing or being a bit too relaxed, lazy, and more this non-doing approach when, when you're trying to do stuff in your life, trying to learn something, trying to uh, do a piece of work, whatever. Three, two, one, two, three or four, three or four, and five. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I'll definitely say that I also, before I started meditating, was definitely a five. <laughs> Even my first in my first uh, meditation retreat, I just tried to push myself so hard, and in the end of the day, I was so burnt out and exhausted and just completely finished. And then, uh, yeah, I, I learned my lesson there the hard way that it's not a sustainable way of, of approaching things. But so, so what's the point of this question? The Buddha um, discovered the middle way, the, the, the middle way between the two extremes of the way we usually do things. So if you know a little bit about the Buddha's life, um, he basically 
here at first he was a prince, uh, you know, had everything he wanted, um, this kind of, yeah, indulging in, in pleasures and being able to do what he likes. Um, he, he got disenchanted with that and then he switched to the other extreme. So he became an ascetic monk. He was super into self-torturing, torturing things, fasting for very long, lots of legends about, you know, he just e eats one grain of rice for like a whole per day for like a whole year um, hold, breath holds. Um, and with self-mortification, he found also at, he, he just, even though he kept trying, he could never kind of escape suffering. And then one day he was kind of had almost given up and he had, was very weak and he couldn't, couldn't really do anything anymore, couldn't stand, couldn't walk. And then this girl from a nearby village, Shujata, brought him a bowl of rice milk and he drank this rice milk and it was so, so nice and sweet. And, and he was sitting underneath a Bodhi tree and then he realized, ah, it's not about punishing myself and pushing myself to the intense extreme of effort. It's not about indulging and chilling and forgetting all about the path. It's, it's a middle way, finding enough comfort and stability that I can do the meditation properly and investigate. Um, so yeah, a little bit like playing a instrument. If the string is too tight, that string will just break and it, it won't really work in the long term. If that string is too loose, the sound won't really come out nicely. But if the string is strung just, just perfectly, then a beautiful tone will emerge. Um, so why am I saying this? It's the same with, with meditation. If we try to approach our meditation with too much effort, willpower, discipline, and we'll likely um, yeah, fall short, we'll get very upset, we'll get a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, maybe aversion and hatred will come up more. If we're a bit too loose, too relaxed, um, um, ah, it's okay, you know, I can just chill, I can lie down, oh, you know, maybe I don't need to, med need to meditate at all, like this is already, then it'll be more like drowsiness, laziness, um, you'll follow your desires more, but it's all about observing our desires. So if you're following your desires, um, you can't really observe them. So yeah, just keep this principle in mind as you meditate, as you do your practice, and likely if you, if you don't have so much experience in meditation yet, you will go into the extremes a little bit, like sometimes you'll be super into doing, sometimes you'll be too relaxed. And, but over time you, you learn what it's like to do that, what it's like to do that. And you learn for yourself, oh, what, what is the way to balance this? And it's kind of act of constant balancing act. Even now in my practice also, uh, it's, not, it's not something that's mastered I, I, because we're different every day, we're different every moment. So we need to find a way to find that sweet spot um, in every session, in every minute, in every breath. Yes. Okay. And to, um, yeah, the last, the last thing that I want to say today is um, meditation seems like something that we do uh, quite selfishly. We sit down and we, are just with ourselves and we meditate. Um, but that's only the means, it's not the, it's not the end itself. It's just the means to an end. Meditation is for ourselves, for our own well-being, but also, also ultimately for the well-being of those around us. And meditation in this form, it gives us the skill that is needed to break this constant self-centered identification. When we have thoughts, 99% of our thoughts, 99.9% .9 of our thoughts are usually about ourselves, um, which is naturally natural, that's fine. And just by creating more space, more recognition around those thoughts, um, we actually start to notice more what's around us rather than being stuck in our habits of worrying, thinking. We notice more, ah, there's, there's another human here. Oh, maybe how can I help this person? How can I help this person? Um, and... Yeah, this, this mindfulness practice, it will naturally balance your tendency. So some people, um, they come and they tend to be too much in caring. So they're always caring about the elders, never caring about themselves. And then you get more burnt out. Meditation will teach you, okay, actually, I need to prioritize myself first, my own well-being. 
then I can help others. If you tend to be more selfish, um, you'll start to realize the, the futility of this selfishness and actually helping others is the best way to help ourselves. Um, we are social beings. We are, um, when we practice loving kindness, when we practice compassion, when we help others, we naturally uh, feel better. So this is actually also um, benefit to ourselves, uh, which more and more we can start to observe um, in our experience. Um, all these different things that make us happy and unhappy. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's the the end of what I had prepared for today, for today in terms of lecture content. And um, we'll just do a quick review. So I like to just um, uh, go through very briefly what we learned. So if you want to, you can just close down the eyes and come into the body if you're not here already. So again, just simple way to do this is just feeling sitting. And whatever you notice about sitting. So today we learned a little bit about the five precepts, why it's useful to follow them. We learned about meditation being kind of cultivation of qualities. And this course really emphasizes the practice of meditation, not to overly intellectualize or think about it, but it's the actual practice is where you change the habit of the mind. That's why we practice two hours a day, which can be quite a lot. And we're learning three things in this course. So the morality, the right intention for meditation is really what underpins the practice. And then we have in the first part of the course, our anapanasati, to become indistractable. And also our vipassana meditation to build insight or wisdom and indistractability and uh, also samadhi is the ability to focus on what you choose so in this case i'm kind of making the choice for you by telling you to focus on your breath at the nose because it's quite a neutral and easy thing to to focus on um, and this kind of indistractability that your training will help you in almost every situation in your life, whether you're talking to someone, whether you're working, whether you're exercising or walking in the park. And then we also learned about the five, pre uh, five hindrances and the things that can stand in the way of meditation. I will also send out something about that today. And these things, these are things that happen to everyone. So don't worry. And lastly, we also talked about the middle way. So we're trying to avoid extremes of effortfulness, willpower, discipline, which can definitely help, but we also want to stay relaxed and at ease and to create the optimal conditioning conditions for our mind to learn. So we're really doing learning. We're learning and understanding our body and mind, our nature. And we do this not only for ourselves, but for others. So this meditation thing will um, help us be, uh, notice more what's around us, notice um, what's needed, what, how we can help the world. Um, And now I invite you to just bring to mind any questions or maybe things you would like me to elaborate on which aren't quite clear or maybe something related to the meditation technique, the practice that came up for you in your practice. Um, and we have about 10 minutes to, to talk about that.
And you can write that in the chat or you can use the kind of raise hand function uh, that Zoom provides. Oh yeah, maybe I'll start here with the question that was asked during the class. And I think it was related to the five hindrances. I can't find it now. Um, but yeah, the hindrances, they will, unless we're quite deep in meditation, usually this for me, this only happens when I'm on like a retreat where I'm doing at least five, six hours a day, then the hindrances completely disappear. But uh, when we're just doing a few hours a day, then likely this will still still be there and yeah it's important to just continue doing the technique doing the thing and not to give them too much energy not to not to feed them Hema's asking about the best time for the evening meditation whether it's before dinner um it's yeah before dinner it would be nice because it uh the digestion typically makes us feel more sleepy, more drowsy. So you can do it then, or you can do it kind of like before you go to sleep, a few hours after dinner. Um, it's nice also not to eat too heavily before meditation um, because the, the, the digestion yeah, makes us drowsy. Um, what I do is usually just before, just before bed, um, after I stopped using any electronics or something like that. It can be nice to do the meditation and after go to bed or maybe read something or something like this kind of as part of the winding down, you don't want to do your evening meditation and then again, start answering emails or something like that because um, it again, creates more, more stuff. <laughs> it can help you sleep better also. But yeah, all these all these kinds of things. They, I encourage you also to experiment a little with them, uh, and see what what works for you. Yeah. What else is there? There, there are no, there are no silly questions. The, the best questions are honest questions. So if you can just, even if you're wondering about something, I don't know if this is stupid or whatever. Like the best questions are just honest questions because they really, um, they show what what is what is needed in in your practice. What what tip or or pointer if you. If you're trying to impress me or I'm trying to impress anyone else with your questions, then um, your question won't likely won't come as much from a genuine place and the answer you'll get won't help your practice as much. But if you're just honest with, okay, this and this, I'm confused. And that will really, the answer will be what you need more likely. If meditation shows you the reflection of who you are, how should I get rid of the guilt of seeing all the hindrances and focusing? Amazing question. Yes, meditation really shows us who we are and we learn who we are. And the thing is that we have to accept who we are. We really have to deeply accept who we are. We have to, we typically just want the good things. We want the good things. Okay, maybe the neutral things, they can stay, but these, bad things about me the way i judge other people the way i uh, hatred comes the way dislike and greed comes i don't like these things i don't want these things but no we have to accept everything about ourselves we have to accept our nature our nature of liking disliking or the nature of guilt and only when we accept these things can we clearly see how they how they work so basically the answer to that 
would be to acknowledge and to realize that guilt is there and guilt is part of your, your nature. It's not about getting rid of them. And it's about seeing them clearly so that we, so that they don't bother us. So that allow that okay, guilt is coming. You feel, okay, I'm liking stuff. I'm disliking stuff. Oh my God, I'm, I'm not, not good at this. I feel guilty. That guilt itself is just something that's arising in your experience. Don't try to identify with it. Don't say, I'm guilty or I'm this. Just say, ah, guilt is coming. Guilt is arising. There's a phenomenon of guilt happening. And let that be there. Let that be here somewhere, maybe in the background. Um, and then just keep coming back to it, just being gently and at ease with the breath. Coming back, coming back. Ah, you notice again, I'm thinking about being guilty. Yeah. Gently coming back, gently coming back, gently coming back, gently coming back. You have to come back a million times or 10 million times <laughs> before that guilt stops bothering you. But it gets better every time. Thank you for the question. Is there anything else from anyone? I guess just just time to practice, huh? <laughs> um, one helpful tip that will make it easier uh, throughout the week is, especially for Anapanasati, is if you bring the technique that you're doing on the cushion into your daily life when appropriate, so you can just notice your breathing. Maybe when you have an idle moment, when you're sitting in traffic jam, when you're in public transport, when you're even when you're working, you maybe between tasks, you can just take a quick break and you don't have to close your eyes and sit cross-legged. You can also just maybe gaze down a little bit and notice the breathing. So never being too far away from that, and that will help you also um, feel more calm and it'll be easier to meditate. Um, but really anything can be your meditation. So even work, so, so indistractability or samadhi or concentration meditation is really, the definition is uh, being able to focus on what you choose. So in the meditation, we're choosing that to be the breath, but you can also, when you're working, choose that to be um, the act of working. So you're working and then you start getting distracted. Maybe you want to check your phone Ah, that's the distraction. I, I'm choosing to focus on my work. Okay, I notice that tendency. Okay, I come back before it gets out of hand. So it's the same thing with the meditation. We notice the thought, the interest before it starts getting out of hand. And sometimes we get caught in it. We realize, oh, I've been browsing my phone for five minutes. Oh, what I'm, what I'm doing? Okay, let's come back to the work. So it's the same in the meditation. Oh, I, I'm meditating, I'm focusing. Oh, I start dreaming about five minutes later. Oh, Reimar's voice is reminding me, oh, okay, what am I doing? Like, I didn't even realize. So anything is the meditation object. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. So, yeah, I'll conclude the, the session for today. And if, yeah. You all probably, hopefully, in the WhatsApp group, I'll keep sharing any, any Q&A that comes up there. I'll keep posting reminders. Um, tomorrow we have the, a live group meditation where we'll meditate together. You can attend that if you want. You don't have to if you don't want to. Um, it's a nice way to go a bit deeper into the practice when you feel that there's a lot of other people meditating with you. Um, but yeah, that's, that's up to you. And Otherwise, on Monday, we'll have another Q&A session where we can talk, exchange, um, and yeah, the rest is up to you. So thank you very much for, for joining today. And yeah, may you have a wonderful practice and yeah, I wish you a beautiful rest of the day wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>